October 21st. We're here at Sunset Sound, and we're joined by a friend of mine and an inspiration and a pivotal musician in a very legendary band called Prince and the Revolution, as well as Prince and the New Power Generation. Dr. Fink, a.k.a. Matthew Fink, is from Minneapolis, and he is here to tell us some amazing stories and we're excited, so I appreciate you coming in here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And you yeah. know what else we're going to do? Yeah. You're going to play some key synths on our sample pack today. Yes, yeah, yes. I'm looking forward to it. You are a worker. You were out here in L.A. because you live permanently in Minneapolis. Yes. Your whole life. Yes. But you were doing a show at uh, Herb Albert's Vibrato Jazz Club. Yeah, with uh, St. Paul and the Minneapolis Funk All-Stars, which is comprised of... Uh, Prince alumni musicians. Wow, who's right. in that? Well, Paul Peterson, who was in the family, nothing compares to you, was on that album. Wow. Before Sinead O'Connor uh, recorded it. And we have Oliver Lieber on guitar, who produced some of Paul Sick. Abdul's and amongst other luminaries over the years. Uh, we have, Je had Je well, we had Jelly Bean Johnson from the time as a special guest that evening, but he joins us regularly when he's not touring with the time. I've been with that group for about a year. You've got uh, Kirk Johnson on drums from the MPG, Elisa Fiorello on vocals from the MPG, and uh, that's that was the group. But uh, there are times when uh, Paul's nephew, Jason Peterson Delaire, who tours with Michael Bolton these days, he joins us when he's available. Very cool. Yeah. Wow, a wrecking crew of a, yes. a band. Minneapolis wrecking crew. <laughs> and you have a studio in Minneapolis yes. uh, that you is open to the public, right? Yeah, um, it's called uh, the Operating Room. I love that. Yeah, it, <laughs> it had a different name for a while, but I changed it back to the the Operating Room. I was gonna have us wear masks today. Yeah, sure, a surgical masks. But then everyone's <laughs> gonna think we're COVID freaks. So. Yeah. How do you feel about COVID? Do you think it's been politicized at all? Yes, and that's wrong. Yeah. All right, well, we don't want to go down that no, road. No, we, we, I'm not going down that rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> Trump or Biden? Me, oh, no, no. Um, I still have friends on both sides, and they're good people on both sides. That's all I'll say. Some people should understand that, that, you know, yep. you can disagree. That's right, and still be friends. Exactly. Yeah. And you can listen. That's right. You know, what's cool, I was driving up here today, and I was going to ask you all these te technical questions because we're doing a sample pack and you're playing keys on it. It's all based on Studio 3, and we're going to distribute that um, during Christmas time through IK Multimedia. It's going to be the greatest sound library ever, and I'm so thrilled that you're on it. Well, thank you. I've interviewed other members of the Revolution, some engineers, and I just kind of wanted to go in this and just talk and not have set questions. Yeah. So that's what's fun about a, a long-form conversation. But when did you first meet Prince? I don't know. I met Prince in Minneapolis officially in Minneapolis at my audition for the band for the revolution. It wasn't even the revolution yet. Okay. This was just his first group he was putting together for the first album release. Oh, he my had gosh. not coined the name revolution until fast forward to 84 for, for purple rain. Uh, that's when he, he really called us Prince and the revolution. But uh, the 1999 album, if you look at the album cover, there's a backwards uh, revolution printed on the little football of the, there's like an eye of Prince that he, you know, that's his artwork, you know, that he drew. So there's like something that looks like the shape of a football and then it says revolution inside of it, but it's spelled backwards. Wow. And that's where he kind of hinted at that or was maybe thinking about it. But I don't recall him ever saying we're called Prince and the Revolution for the 1999 tour. But is this <clears throat> pre Warner Brothers? No, no, this Owen was, no. He was always signed to Warner's from the from okay. day one. And in, 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 did you know him though in Minneapolis before all that? Before I, he came out here, the studio eighty days. I only knew Prince through uh, Bobby and David Rifkin, and when I in nineteen seventy seven, late seventy seven, uh, Bobby brought me the demo tape. It's from Sound eighty that David Rifkin had, 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 had done for with Prince. So Bobby wanted me to hear it. I, I had known Bobby for many years. We grew up in the same community. He was a couple of years older than me, but but because we were fellow musicians and our families knew each other through some things that they would uh, socialize with occasionally. And uh, so Bobby brought it to a, sh a gig I was doing one night during a during a break in the in the sets. I, I went out to the his car and listened to the cassette, and I just said, "This is amazing. What who, who is what's who's the band?" You know, and he goes. It's not a band. I go, it's not a band. 
well, what is this? He goes, it's a young guy, your age, because we're Prince and I are the same, we're contemporaries, same age. Yeah. And he said he's your age, and he produced and wrote and played everything on here and sang everything. And I went it, it, with my brother co-producing, you know, engineering to, you know, and I go, well, what are you doing with this? He goes, well, Owen Husney, who I'm currently working for as an assistant, is going to take this to the major labels and see if they can get him a record deal because he's incredibly talented. I said, obviously. So let me know, is he putting a band together? He goes, eventually. And I said, do you think I could meet him and audition for the group? He said, possibly. So when the time came for him looking for band members, that's when I... I, I hit Bobby up and Owen actually, and just said, "Hey, can I get an audition?" And it took a while though. They were they were checking out a lot of different people out here and in Minneapolis, and um, eventually I did get my foot in the door. And uh, once I auditioned for Prince, you know, there was a good three week lag before he made his decision. But then, uh, fortunately for me, he he hired me. But, well, you know, the thing is though, even the Warner Brothers executives. You know, they were trying to pair him with a producer uh, right off the bat when they signed him. Yeah. When, and they were all raving that this guy had played all the instruments, which is amazing. Yeah. But he wasn't the, the first to do that. No, Stevie like, Wonder did it. Todd yeah, Rundgren a lot of people did. It. A lot of people have been doing it. But they used it as a marketing ploy. Yeah, you know, yeah. Marketing, te- you know, the young guy is barely 18, you know, and, did it, you know. I think they fudged his age by a year, but regardless, you know, they want to make it look like the young prodigy, you know. Yeah, what do you remember about, though... You knew Bobby Z, David Z. Yeah. What do you remember about, was Prince playing around Minneapolis? Yeah, he was, but I wasn't aware of him Okay. for some reason. I don't know why. You didn't have Instagram then? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you got to remember, Minneapolis, you know, unfortunately, I hate to say this, but it was a bit segregated in those days. And, you know, we had, the radio waves were segregated. So when he was breaking out, he couldn't get airplay on major stations. He, he had to be played at the local uh, black station, which was called KMOJ. Once he crossed over, probably because Michael Jackson helped with that with the MTV era, and then Prince had 1999 and Corvette hit in 82 from that album, that really helped Prince uh, get, get, become known as a pop artist with everybody, you know? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so, so Prince had a... Um, uh, another mentor at that time by the name of Peppy Willie, who had a band called 94 East. Mm-hmm. They were signed to Polygram, I believe, or Polydor, I can't remember. I always get the two confused. I think it was Polydor. And um, so Bobby had been playing drums actually with Peppy. And Peppy was one of Prince's, like, uh, he was related to Prince through a marriage of one of Prince's cousins. And that's how he met Prince. So uh, Peppy brought prince into the studio to play guitar when prince was 15 and that album is actually out it's called the cook house five sessions or something like that and i actually mixed those songs for peppy because he brought that to me in like 20 i don't know 2008 or oh wow you're a mixing engineer sure sure. i didn't know that yeah okay but regardless uh it it was it was kind of like recorded a little more rough you know it took a lot to try to make it sound right but anyway that's neither here nor there but um the uh he was uh, allowing prince to rehearse in his basement in the how his house at that time to with the the first incarnation of that band so i went there for the audition in late I believe it was october of 78 okay because he would rent homes out here prince yeah but he never had like an official house. I mean, maybe later, but in right. those days, he was just kind of coming out exactly. for a month, going back. That's right. Where did he live in Minneapolis? Was he? Well, he had several locations, you know. But he, I was born he, in Minneapolis. Oh, okay. Well, his the the last house that he had in Minneapolis was right near Paisley Park, which was way out in the western suburbs of Chanhassen, Minnesota. That's a good thirty minute drive west of the Twin Cities or more, you know. It was, without traffic <laughs> no but during that period oh, where, the, oh the early where, period yeah he, he was he was he just had a, a cute little house uh, like a also just in one of the close-in suburbs you know he was renting a place in those days gotcha and then he get then his next home was uh he had something out on lake minnetonka 
made famous in Purple Rain. Yeah, he was renting a house there. That's actually where we recorded Dirty Mind when I co-wrote Dirty Mind with him. That was done out at his little, he had a little 16-track home studio setup with a, with a two-inch 16-track. And he, he did a lot of tracking to that. And then he would bring that to here, to Sunset Sound or where, whatever studio he was working out of here and do more overdubs and, and also track new, new songs as well. He didn't do everything at that location, yeah. but that's where we did uh, Dirty Mind. And then I also performed on the, the song Head on that album and did the uh, solo, synthesizer solo on that song. Amazing. Yeah. So you were a part of all the first records. Yes. I, I thought it was... Yes. Well, the sure first, a lot of people didn't see you till a certain point, so they didn't know that you played on those earlier. Well, stuff, the first uh, two stuff. albums were released and those were done all by himself. He had nobody else working on those, but I was already in the band. So, so I was brought on board, uh, you know, like five, six, seven months after the first album had been released. And then I was there for the second album, but he, again, did the majority of it here in LA and then brought it back to us and said, here's the tape, go learn it. <laughs> <sighs> and then Dirty Mind, he started bringing in people in to perform on the albums, like yeah. myself and Lisa Coleman, um, I, I, maybe Andre, uh, Simone. God, maybe so many did. questions just immediately. Yeah, I know, there's a lot talking. of I'll stop, go ahead. No, 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 questions. I mean, I'm just kidding. it's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, first off, what was your first unit that you were playing on right then? Like your- Oh, keyboard-wise? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the earliest uh, were the, the SEM Oberheim, modules you know you could get a four voice or an eight voice yeah for those of you who aren't don't know about this uh those oberheim polyphonic machines had a a, a a monophonic synthesizer like four of them lined up on the four voice so you could play four notes at a time and that was like constituted four separate modules uh, monophonic modules Sick. to create four voices and then you could put uh, another four voices on top of that if you wanted an eight voice, you could add another thing that kind of piggybacked on the top of the four voice. That's killer. But we never had the eight voices. We had two four voices, one for me and one for uh, Gail Chapman, who was our first keyboardist at that time. I've been trying to get in touch with Oberheim. I, they're still a small company, but like yeah. they have incredible, incredible gear they make. I love it. The yeah. sounds. Um, have you noticed that on like Billboard and then popular music now it sounds a lot like the, things the 80s that you guys, again yeah. yes i said that to the toto guys i was like this is just all 80s reinvented and yeah. sampling and synths and drum machines and yeah it's I'd, I'd say the weekend has kind of brought that back quite a bit too that yeah. 80s sound yeah and that's what like a and r is good a and r is they predict trends in music yeah. you know you it's or finding something different but uh, a lot of the stuff is like almost complete derivatives or just kind of ripped off of a lot yeah, of stuff. Yeah, totally. Watching Prince create in a studio, you know, and also he's limited to 24 tracks at that time. Yeah. Which is simply incredible. We really, we did like one special show in January of 1979 in Minneapolis for the Warner Brothers people. They flew in, we did two nights with the local Minneapolis audience at a place called the Capri Theater. And that was just a, you know, introduce us to them and see what they thought and see if we're coming together. And, you know, we did the show. There were there was one technical glitch where we had kind of a, an early wireless guitar setup that was picking up police radio uh -huh. right in the middle of the show. And we had to stop and pause in the show and apologize to the audience and get a, a wired guitar going for Des Dickerson, the guitar player. So that caused a problem. But other than that, it went pretty well. But then at the end of the show, we met with the Warner Brothers people and you know, the president was there and the head of A&R, you know, and they said, you know, not bad, but Prince, you need to go back in the studio now and do the second record. And we'd like you to, you know, take a break, come out and finish this new record and have, keep rehearsing your band. And then we'll, we'll get you guys out on the road. Cause they, you know, the first album, the single came out, you know, soft and wet, it did okay, but it, it just, you know, it's hard to promote those first records. Yeah. You know, sometimes they take off, sometimes they don't. But, he, you know, they said, go back to the drawing bar board, keep working the band, you guys still need more work. Because we'd only rehearsed with me in it for two months, not even that, leading up to that show. I mean, it was we were so green at the time. So uh, we didn't really have our stage persona or images together yet. And then fast forward to uh, 
early summer of uh, 79, and we were rehearsing the second album by then. That had been finished, and the song I Want to Be Your Lover was the single, and that was out. And so they they booked us for a what's called a showcase club tour around the United States. And I'd say about three-quarters of the way through that tour, Prince developed a bad case of laryngitis, mm. and he made the decision to uh, cancel the last three dates because of that. And that was also because our management, which was, um, I believe at that time, Cavallo, Ruffalo, Farnoli had mm -hmm. gotten involved and uh, they were Earth, Wind and Fires people and some other people. And they, they found uh, us a tour to open for Rick James. Mm -hmm. So we did this Rick James tour that went from uh, late 79 into spring of 1980 and that really brought us uh, out to more people and so prince after that thought you know i'd like to try headlining the third album see if we can do headline dates and he management said well i don't know yet i don't know if you're big enough to do that yet but prince insisted on it so they tried it some cities went well some didn't you know yeah. we were maybe filling half arenas in some of the markets so they said, okay, um, let's get the next album out, which was Controversy after that tour ended. And then by then we were able to tour and fill up theaters and do pretty well, do some arenas in various cities. And it wasn't really till the 1999 tour when that record really took off and went you know, double, triple platinum that year when we could officially be a headlining sold out act. Was when you guys would play "I Want to Be Your Lover" live? Was it always like a ten, twelve minute jam? No, we we would do a, a kind of a, a truncated version of the album version, but we still took it out to the end vamp, but it was shorter. Yeah, at that point, I love that song. Yeah, it's a great song. Were you in the band when Prince opened up for the Rolling Stones? Yes. Tell me about that day, please. Okay, the the. Uh, Famous or infamous Rolling Stones incident, you know. Yeah, I want your uh, interpretation, but also just give me like the buildup. What was was Prince excited? Did he not want to do it? Was yeah, I think he was excited. Okay, and, and none of us really uh, had an inkling as to what was about to unfold, which was, you know, we were the the first act on the bill. There were four groups, with including the Rolling Stones, so we had to go out there. You know, the sun is still up. It's like four in the afternoon or so. Our set was only going to be about a th maybe 35 minutes long, 40 tops. Uh, we got out on, out on stage, and for whatever reason, there were a number of people in the audience which didn't seem to like what we were doing. And I think they were most turned off by Prince's image, maybe, which was trench coat, three guys up front, trench coats, uh, Prince in particular, trench coat. But he had a shirt on, a bandana, and he, he had like kind of thigh high with leg warmers and high heeled boots and all that. So I, I just don't know. They, there may have been racist elements. I don't know because we were such a, we were mixed. You know, we, you had three black guys up front, you had three white folks and a, two white guys and a girl, white girl in back. And it's kind of like, that was kind of different. It was kind of like um, Prince wanted to make it more like a Fleetwood Mac kind of thing where you had men and women in the group. and But this was multiracial compared to that. So uh, the, a lot of people weren't ready for that. There wasn't a lot of that yet. You know, Sly and the Family Stone had done it, but... Yeah, lots of bands. And, and here's the thing. Sunshine Band, a lot of the groups... Yeah, I, I mean, I, the only thing I can think of is that the, there were elements of the Stones audience that may have been racist. Oh, I'm sure there were. Yeah, and so that's the only thing I can think of. So they were violent. They, I don't think they threw stuff at us. I mean, they were throwing bottles and food and can, pop on, cans. Slow down for one second. So what do you guys come out to? What, do you remember the song you played first? No, I can't remember okay. now. You know, everybody's excited, though. There was no bad vibes until right. you got on stage and yeah. then... You're getting names called, you're hearing things. Well, well, this is I, the Coliseum I, in Los Angeles? Yeah, there's 90,000 people out okay. there. And and then, I mean, they were flipping us the bird. I mean, I saw, I saw at least half the people in the first 40, 50 rows were being hostile. Wow. Yeah, and the, 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 the fingers were going up. The food was being thrown. I saw a bottle, a, a glass bottle miss 
Prince's head by Jesus. like half an inch of that. And that's when I was really scared for him. And then he was scared. So he, he left the stage and told us to end the song, and we did. And then he, uh, he headed home. He just said, I'm done. I'm not going to do any more of these. We, we were slated to play four more big stadium shows with, with the, the Stones. stones. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, he flew back to Minneapolis, and then uh, Mick Jagger literally called us when we were in one of the, I think we were in Dez's room. He found out where we were. He called the hotel. Hey, I want to talk to the band. He, he got us on the phone with him, and he, he begged us to put him back in touch with Prince to convince him to come back and do the next show in L.A. because there were two of them at, at the Coliseum. Oh, wow. It was one Friday night and one Sunday. So we had the day off on Saturday, and management and Mick Jagger personally convinced him to fly back to L.A. and, and fulfill the second show there. And we did, and we had the same problem again where people were hostile. I didn't know there was a second show. Oh, yeah, there was a second show. And then Prince said, okay, this is too dangerous for us, so we're not going to do the rest of the shows, and that was that. Did he walk off? Did he? Did you guys finish the set uh, the first night? We we did not finish that set. So three, we, four songs in. Yeah, maybe three, four songs we finished. Then the next set we didn't quite finish either, but he stayed up there with us and ended a song, and then we got off stage. There's a perfect lesson to learn here, kids. It's actually how we started this whole interview. It's about labeling people and stereotypes, and if that audience would have heard... Prince plays some of the solos and some of the stuff he's capable of and his musicianship, mm -hmm. they would completely see him differently, but they didn't even give him a chance. No. They saw him, if it was racially motivated or they didn't like funk sounds or whatever it was. But that's exactly what we were just talking about. And, you know, it's like that's so unacceptable to do that to any artist. Yeah. Even if you don't like them, it's not, I mean, why be hostile? They're still doing that Just today. Just let them the do time. their thing and let them be. It's like, I mean, that that was astounding to me. I was in shock, really. I'd never seen, first of all, I'd never seen anything like that happen at a concert yeah. of that level with any artist. And I, I just thought it was just really despicable, you know. Did you notice awful. that took a toll on him? I mean, if I had to go through that, and this is music I've created and I've collected my feelings together and wrote them out and I made this music and then somebody was so <laughs> against it. Adamantly opposed to you. I your would artistry. probably kill myself. No, he handled it really well. In fact, he, he just said, you know, this is, that's their audience. We have our audience, we yeah. have our fans and we're going to be fine. And I said, yeah, you're right. So what do you personally talking. think gave Prince the, the drive? And I always say Michael Jordan, like he had a, dr a drive to work every moment to be the biggest star. Um, and that's so <clears throat> inspiring. But what do you, where do you think that came from? There's wanting to be, wanting to share your music with everyone, but he was so far past that. Yeah. He was, you know, he worked every minute. Why, why? I can't answer that. I never really asked him. I didn't say, I didn't go up to him and say, Hey, why are you such a workaholic? No, I asked what you thought though. Why oh, what you, I thought? Yeah. Where's that work ethic come from? Is it just not having anything growing up, family home? He was just yeah. so driven. Well, he had a, he had a bit of a rough childhood Yeah, a little bit with his parents. Um, his, his parents were divorced and then she, his mother remarried somebody, uh, another man who was not the nicest to him. And, uh, and then his real father, um, at one point was disappointed with him as well and said, you're going to have to go move out of the house with your friend Andre Simone. Uh, I won't get into why. It's, it's been, you know, talked about. Yeah. Uh, so regardless, um, he just, he loved music obviously so much that he was driven just because of his love of music. That's the only thing I can think of and to prove himself because A, he, he, he was a small guy, he loved playing basketball, but he wasn't tall enough to be on the team. Even though he did play in high school, he was able to do that. He, he aspired and got really, really good at basketball in spite of his height. And uh, he was just highly motivated. I know that he was a straight-A student in high school and that he is just a brilliant guy, really a genius. I mean, he could, you know, remember things and yeah, it's he, interesting. He, was a, he was, had a lot of knowledge that he accumulated over the years. There's people that have horrible home lives growing up and yeah. they get into crime, they get into drugs, they, you know, have numerous and, problems yeah. in life, but then... Others don't. Yeah, exactly. No. And that's kind of... It, 
it's just, you being you working so closely with him for so long. I just wondered what you personally thought, what why he was. But no, you answered it. I mean, it's yeah. who knows what it was. It was something in him that just he, he was never driven. Stop. That's all I can say. Yeah, and I really respected that because I didn't have that. I, I wanted to aspire to it more, but I couldn't keep up with them. <laughs> what was the funnest part for you, working in the studio or performing live? Both. They were both equally enjoyable. Yeah. I'd say live had an edge, though. I can. The live thing definitely has an edge. I would totally. Yeah. <clears throat> die if I, I never got to see him live once, and that's um, you know everybody did, it. even people my age or younger. You know, he did the forum thing, and you finish up controversy which he had came in here at the tail end of that i think he did a few days on dirty mind you kind of remember rehearsing uh, no no it was off of controversy it was okay. called the song was called jack you off <laughs> <laughs> i'll never forget when he brought the song to us and i said that's the title you're gonna put a song out called jack you off he goes yep i go that you're that's gonna be there's going to be issues. I'm just telling you, that's why I'm doing it. I go, okay, <laughs> fine. I went, I mean, you know what? I never said you can't do that yeah. or don't do that. I just would, because I personally like being a rebel. I was, I was a total rebel like him. Shock tactics. I mean, yeah, totally today to and shocking, like you know, but, but that was a first. He was doing things that, you know, like the song head on the dirty mind album was like a first, you know, and the lyrics to that. I mean, it was just here, I'm going to lay it on, on the table. This is the, we're human beings. This is what we do. Why are we denying it? Yeah. You know? He was using shock tactics, obviously, to get attention on a lot of this stuff. Sure. And it was cool. It was great. Yeah. And, but did you see him with a lot of women early on then? Was he like a ladies' man? I mean, I know later on the success and... You Not know, in the on. early days. He he had a, a really wonderful gal as his girlfriend in those days, in the earliest few years that was like a high school sweetheart. Yeah. And she, she, he stayed friends with her all his life, really. Gotcha. So, what was her name? Kim Upshur. She was a wonderful gal. You still speak with? May she rest in peace. Oh, she passed away. Yeah, she uh, passed not maybe six months before him. Oh wow. Yeah. Did you work with the Hookers or any of those little side groups that he had? It's like Susan Muncy was in that. And... I yeah, you know, I did a little few sessions on it, yeah. and I also played on uh, the first time album as well oh, on wow. a couple songs. Where was that recorded? Minneapolis. Here. <sighs> I you know. All over. I th yeah, I mean, I, some of it was done here and some of that was done. You know, I do remember doing that here. Come to think of it, the stick solo was done here. We have, well, there's a yeah. ton of time on the work that's right. orders. Yeah, that's where I did it. I have Polaroids here. of Morris Day hanging on three and obviously the Maserati yeah. story with um, yeah. him writing the demo in three, taking the tapes over there. Were you here for that? Say that again? Which Maserati and Kiss and they recorded I Kiss. was not a around for that, no. Yeah. What a wild time. I mean, that's what I love about Sunset. It just looks looks exactly the same. But, yeah. you know, Susan, I was talking to her, Rogers. She's like, yep, he played the acoustic, uh, wrote, you know, a little two-chord Kiss demo, and we sent the tapes over to Studio 2 to David Z and Maserati, yep. and, and they sent them back. And it's just like the nostalgia of hearing those things when you're sitting right here. Have you ever heard the Maserati version? Uh, no, but I'm... I sorry. have. Do you have it? Somewhere at home, yeah. I oh, have my a copy gosh. of it. It's pretty close to the original... It, it it had some slight differences, but but a lot of the same elements were there when Prince decided to take it back for himself at that point. I mean, they produced it up and made it yes. cool and a yeah. hit, and then Prince took that and just said, all right, this is mine now. Well, he originally gave it to Maserati to do something with it, and when he heard what a great job they did, he decided, well, you know, <laughs> I think I should do this one now. <laughs> That's interesting, huh? That kind of behavior... Was that pretty common? No, that was a rare moment. Gotcha. That kind of thing was that was kind of a one of a kind moment. Yeah, as far as I know. And he did a lot of stuff people don't know about. He's very yeah. generous. Yeah, you know, did yeah, a lot no of question. stuff with ch ch children and charity. Yeah. When the album 1999 is complete and you're getting ready to tour and you hear 1999 in its com complete form, are you like, wow, this is going to do something big? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was an amazing record. In fact, it was a bit daunting to. You know, when he brought it initially for me to learn the stuff I didn't work on, which was the majority of it, and uh, <clears throat> it was just like, wow, this is this is going to be interesting. Yeah. How we're going to do do this live now? We were just talking about the uh, 
intro, that deep vocal on the title track, 1999. Yes. How was that done? I think a uh, an eventide harmonizer was used to bring his voice down to that low octave. Yeah. Alex, can we do that today? And I don't even know. They may have VSO'd the tape, too. I don't know. They may have done both to make that, create that effect. We have the exact harmonizer that was used. Yeah, all that I saw stuff. it. I uh, saw it in there. <laughs> so Might cool. be able to recreate Wait, it. Well, I mean, that's the sound library sample pack that we've created now for a year. Myself, uh, Carmen Vandenberg on guitar. We brought in a ton of great musicians. But we have the drum machine. We have the Lin LM1. We have the Lin drum. We have the console that was used on all that stuff. We have the piano, the 1907 Steinway, the microphones, the famous Neumann U47 he did everything on. I mean... Yeah. And it's not just about Prince, it's about the 80s and Studio 3 and the vibe and nostalgia with this gear. So anybody can enjoy it all over the world. And that'll be through IK Multimedia. For those that don't know, what was the group, uh, the band that was touring the record 1999? You? Uh, that was me, Lisa Coleman on keyboards, Bobby Z on drums, Des Dickerson on guitar, Mark Brown. No. Brown Mark. Brown Mark. On bass. Brown Mark was on bass at that time. And Prince. Wow. Yeah. What was the dynamic? Was it a fun time? Was everybody very serious? Yeah, it was, it was fun. We always had fun. Yeah. We always had fun. Prince, Prince his sense of humor, being around him, joke, joking around with him, hanging, was always a fun time. We all we, we all like to make each other laugh as much as we could, you know, and joke around and, and when, do stuff. And know. Susan would be with you for some of that too, wouldn't she? A little on bit. On the road? A little bit. And then you'd stop at studios on the road also. And yeah, right. That's and true. He would <laughs> if he needed us to come in with him. You know, at that time he, he was utilizing uh, Lisa Coleman quite a bit for background vocals and some some keyboard work as well. As far as I know, um, he didn't really need me per se, uh, but I have I had my own style of soloing and playing. And then when he felt like you know he wanted me on something, he'd bring me in because I brought a different flavor at that point from what he provided. Yeah. But, but technically, he was a great keyboard player. You know, he could do anything. You, if you listen to the, the keyboard solo on the song, Lady Cab Driver, that flutey Oberheim thing, what a classic piece of work. I mean, yeah. I, I, of course, I recreated that note for note live, but, I mean, come on. I think it's just genius. It's brilliant. So Tasty. when he's sitting here in the studio for 20 hours straight and he can play every instrument, yeah. he would he just need someone objectively to kind of come in and be like, what do you think about this synth part here? What do you think about this key solo? Never. He'd never give you the satisfaction of that. But what would he call you in for then if he could do everything? Just, you know, well, I want you to do this you know, or come up with something here. But, I, you know, the collaborative thing, really came more into play for the whole band when it was the became the revolution uh, des dickerson had left you know des you know did wrote songs with prince too we all did we all had stuff that we did but not a ton okay not a lot and then purple rain happened and that's when he really incorporated the group on uh, at least half the album or more we were we were tracking in fact when we tracked the basic tracks for that record, it was done live at First Avenue Club where we debuted those songs we'd been rehearsing for the movie for that summer of 1983. So that show took place August 3rd, 1983 at First Avenue and it was recorded on a uh, to a recording truck out in the... Yeah, David Z recorded David it. recorded it in the alley next door. He and, drove a truck from out here, actually. Yeah, I think it was from out here. And the, the actual uh, song Purple Rain had an extra verse that was edited out from that version. Oh, wow. For the final movie version. And then strings, live strings were overdubbed. Yeah, we did all that here in Studio yes, 3. exactly. And you, uh, you have a lot of writing credits, but a lot of these songs would sometimes be kind of formulated in rehearsal, too. Yeah, um, or even Purple soundtrack. Rain was the song Purple Rain, uh, uh, the song Computer Blue. When's the first time you heard Purple Rain? When he brought it to rehearsal at the warehouse, the warehouse in Flying St. Louis Lotus? Park. Yeah, no, no, there was another one in St. Louis Park that we okay. were, were in my hometown actually, in my home suburb. Was it a tape or he played it for you? He just brought it in to, to play it, uh, not on tape. It was he was just said, Here's some chords and I'm going to sing you this melody. I don't have the lyrics done yet. I want you all to start playing it 
what you want to put on this. And that's how that came together. What does it feel like to hear something in its infancy like that? And it's one of the biggest, then you hear it at the Super Bowl and it's like billions of people are watching it. It's special to you, isn't it? It's extreme. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. fame, the money, the cool touring and everything, but it's like you were there and heard Purple Rain when it was just a, you know, a G and a Z. Exactly. So, it, you know, it's, it's really something. And when you, when you're, when, when we first heard the final mixes of that record and, and we knew it was going to be put into this film and, uh, we were just all hopeful and knew that it would, it would do well. We just were hoping though that it would be successful. Yeah. It's all you can do. You know, you, you believe in it and you hear it and you go, this is fantastic stuff, Prince. You, I mean, you've, outdone yourself again creatively watching him totally watching him create in a studio where you're just blown away every day uh, uh, totally See, totally yeah. well when i first is when i heard the first album uh, the first time i heard it just the opening piece of him singing that acapella church godlike ethereal vocal of his falsetto singing for you that just that i mean nobody did that it, I, I just was i was like what is this it was. I had the same reaction I had when I brought Sergeant Pepper home at the age of nine and played it for the first time. Same thing. Yeah. A question I have to ask is, and I never understood, and even for the engineers it was difficult, he would say, if the groove is there, nothing else matters, meaning a lot of this stuff was one take sometimes. Why would he not take time to really tighten it up, in I your opinion? I have no idea. I never asked him. It was just burn through. You got it down. Good. Let's go. Oh, I listened to raw tracks on stuff from time to time. I'd get in the studio. If I needed to make a, a special version mix for myself to hear what he did on the keyboards to bring them out in the mix, I'd listen to stuff and I'd hear all kinds of flaws. But then in the in the mix, it disappears. It's really interesting. And and rhythmically, if there's something was slightly off, it would still work. Yeah. You know, if everything's it's the human feel, whatever that is. But it was never there was never anything blatant. You know, if there was something blatant, I'm sure he repair, he fix it at the time. But you could still hear the, you know, warts and all, and it still worked great. You know. Yeah. He would kick everybody out when he did vocals. Yeah, I knew that. I knew about that, See, which was also interesting. An interesting w way he did things. I think he he didn't want anybody like watching him. I mean, he had to he. I think it was something psychological, obviously, for him to be alone in there for to really get his emotions flowing properly and not feel uncomfortable with somebody sitting there running the tape machine and being there or maybe says something. It can, you know, there's a concentration level I felt he must have wanted yeah. to really emote properly. Do you remember Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis coming around at those in those days? Um <clears throat> well, sure. Um, no, actually, they well, only, they really were involved. Obviously, for uh, the first, let's see, the first album was like what about Dirty Mind era? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and we toured with them. So yeah, they were they were hanging out a bit, but not so much because they were off in their own rehearsal world, whatever they were doing. Sure. Yeah. I just saw Jimmy Jam at. Uh, I just saw him Tuesday night. Oh yeah, yeah. he's everywhere. Yeah, he is everywhere, and I. Yeah. It was Dave Chappelle's Grammy party down oh, the street okay. from here. And yeah. I was like, we got to get you to come in here and tell some stories. Because Studio 3 in the hallways where they were canned by Prince, which was such a blessing in disguise. For them. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Even if they'd stayed longer with the time, they still would have been successful as producers, no matter what. I mean, yeah. they, they would have just done something fantastic, I'm sure. Writing credits, obviously, um, sometimes people didn't get credits on certain things, but you did. And one of them is... One of my favorite Prince songs, which is Computer Blue. How did that come to be? What, what did you write? What did you do? Where did you come up with it in rehearsal? I, I basically did the bass part on synthesizer at a sound check one day when we were jamming. And he he just took that and built the song around it. I, I you know, it's like normally you shouldn't get credit for that. For it, that's almost like a session player fee for something like that. But whatever it was, it was the catalyst for the song. So he looked upon it as, well, that was the spark. So I'm going to give you a, a little piece of the song. You know, it was a, it was a five way split song with Prince, Wendy, and Lisa, and Prince's father and Prince himself. So oh, yeah, 
that's how that song worked out. Prince's father wrote the bridge. The bridge, the instrumental bridge melody came from his father. I think also that's a gift he cared about. Exactly. The people. It, he did, yeah. Because I, I, I felt like, wow, you're being awfully generous, you know, and just because I didn't write any lyrics or melody on it, which is, normally constitutes the, the songwriting side for the yeah. you know, divvying up royalties. But, uh, yeah, he was generous in that sense. The film Purple Rain, um, obviously management prints come to you and they're like, hey, Warner Brothers wants to do a film now. Um, yeah, he took me aside personally uh, one morning on the 1999 tour. I was, I was sitting in the hotel. We were on tour and or at the restaurant. He came over and sat with me and just struck up a conversation and said, so uh, I've been thinking about doing a movie. I go, a movie? What do you mean, like a, like a rock and roll film? Like a rock and roll you know, thing. And he goes, yeah. I mean, with a plot though, with a plot and song. Goes, yeah, with a plot. Cause I'm thinking, oh, is it going to be a live thing or just a live, like sign of the times eventually, you know, when he did that. But no, he, he said, no, we're doing an actual film with a plot and everything, people acting, the whole thing. And I said, well, that, I, perfect. I'm on board. Go for it. Why not? Yeah, and you're uh, in the movie. What's that? You got a line in the movie too. Yeah, and I got a line in the movie. <laughs> Actually, I had more lines, but they got cut out of the script for Fuckers. some reason. But darn. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway um, it, it. I was I was a little concerned because obviously he, he, I didn't know how he could act or I mean I knew interacting with him his personality could be part of the good acting routine if you really you know if you just be himself that could work and he was pretty much but i in the movie i could tell he was acting you know a little bit because you know yeah, yeah. it felt a little forced here and there but that was fine that's how you got to be you know and but yeah i was worried you know i was like oh boy i hope he can pull this off you know we all did we were all concerned and then it was difficult for his management to really sell the idea to warner brothers mm -hmm. as well because they thought well you know yeah you here, this album's done great. Yeah, you've sold mil you know several million. That's good, but we don't know if you're well known enough to support a, a rock and roll film, you know, like a, like the way Mick Jagger, David Bowie had done already. But the way they got it done was his management said, "How about if we kick in a lot of the funding? You guys kick in some of the funding, and then we get a bigger percentage or something if it succeeds." Yeah. And they went they went with it. Wow, and it and it succeeded. It's like the film Rocky. Uh, you know, yeah. Sylvester Stallone was pretty much homeless. He wrote that script, uh, took it to a studio. They loved it. They mm -hmm. go, but we don't want you. And that's they wanted Purple Rain script too. They just didn't want. Um, they were going to put Travolta in that. I heard. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> they tell Sylvester, "Hey, we love it. We'll give you a hundred grand, but you're not in it. You know, we don't even know you. You talk weird." A month later, he comes back. I want to do this film. Like, we don't want you. We'll give you 150 now. They go all the way up to three hundred thousand dollars to to Sly and say we did not see you in this. Wow. And he said, Well, I'm not doing it unless I am the lead character. I wrote this for me. Yeah. And they gave him thirty thousand dollars and said, Okay, you can be in it. That went on to be best picture, best actor, best editing. Same thing with you know Purple Rain. I mean, it's you know '80s kind of cheesy flick, but you know it's such an iconic piece of American pop culture and just yeah. the t-shirts and the posters and still to this day, I mean, there's a mega producer here now that's wearing one in Studio 3, just Purple Rain. But the only thing about... The marketing of it. Yeah, but the only thing about now when you go back and look at the film, it, it's dated in the sense of some of the misogyny that took place in the film. You know, it's a little like, like because you have this much bigger awareness of, of sexual abuse and misogyny and and mm -hmm. women saying, you know, you, 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 you can't treat me like that anymore. And I agree that that's unacceptable. Uh, and, you know, there's a scene where Morris Day take, gets mad at some girl right at the beginning of the film and takes her and puts her in a dumpster, you know, <laughs> physically lifts her up and puts her. So, like, you look now and you go, okay, that was funny at the time, slapsticky, but I don't think you might get canceled if you did something like that now. Yeah. You know, and, he, and, and you know, and Morris in particular was was viewed to me more like womanizing in the film than Prince was. So that's that's the only part now in hindsight that's not jibing with current trends. 
Yeah. For you, was that pretty exciting? Because you're from Minneapolis, you know, you get Prince's or uh, Minneapolis's, you know, golden child kind of is rising up and you're a part of that. And, yeah. you know, you're in your hometown and now you're shooting a film there. It's an exciting time. You're a young guy, you're a musician. It was cool, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. It's very and it hit exciting. you so quickly, too. I mean, a few years, it's like he joined the band, do a few records, a few tours, and then boom, now there's a film. And then Purple Rain, the film, blows the whole thing up then. Yeah. So then you're doing stadiums at that point, right? Headlining? Yeah, yeah. And Arenas and stadiums, depending on the city. Who is Prince at that point then, after the film? He turns into, you know, I've heard the stories around here, you know, the Rolls Royce starts coming around, the bodyguards, everything. He's just... Yeah. Did he change... Um, as a leader, as a as a friend, as a musician to you, or was he just still... He became more distant because he was so busy all the time, you know, so he didn't have as much time for socializing. But when we would be on tour, he, he loved to hang with us, at, you know, do after show parties with us or jam and play or whatever. He, he was always, you know, into hanging out with us yeah. when he could. But yeah, there was less. There was definitely less of that, no question. And the relationship at times felt more like boss employee kind of thing, too. Yeah. How was your gear elevating? Like, what what stuff were you working on then? And how was synthesis well, progressing? Also, just in the technological space. Yeah. Once I was in the group, um, I was always in tune with the next thing coming out from the manufacturers every yeah. year. Whatever was brand new. I would introduce it to Prince. I would get get a you know a, the newest synthesizer, bring it to rehearsal. I'd, I'd go to the you know the sh local stores who I had good relationships with at that point. And I'd say, hey, can we try this out? And they go, yeah. So I, I brought just about everything to rehearsal for him to see, and then we'd decide to use it or not, you know, yeah. on things or if we thought it was worthwhile having. So that's that's how it kept evolving year to year. That was kind of like my job. He wasn't interested in that. To be able to sit there, though, uh, you know, on a keyboard or a synth with him, just you two, and kind of figure stuff out and create, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, like, so special. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Very fortunate. I'm so grateful to have met him. That's all I can say. One of those things. Why did the revolution break up? Oh, well, that's a, a story that I don't like to tell, <laughs> really. I kind of like to let the other band members tell that story because it's very personal for them. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> but Wendy, Lisa, Susanna, it was internal, personal things, and you're just, yeah. you know, there for... Yeah, I, I unfortunately, I never got caught in the middle of any of that stuff. All I did, all I could do was to tell Prince, I, I feel like you shouldn't break the band up at this point. I think it's a mistake. And I, I did my best to dissuade him from doing that, but he didn't, he wasn't having it. So uh, at that time, he said, I'm letting Wendy and Lisa and Bobby go right now. I would understand if you wanted to leave, but I don't want you to leave, and I'm giving you the choice of staying or going at this point. He said, Prince personally said this to you yeah. in Minneapolis. Yes. Where at? Your house? No, he called me on the phone. Oh, gotcha. And I was, I, I just was in shock. You know, I said, what, you know, and anyway, there, there's some pretty personal, uh, things that went on that I just don't want to discuss. Sure, and I don't want you to either. I just, yeah. you know, I wanted your interpretation of why this amazing I, I know, band. Yeah, it, I know Wendy and Lisa in other interviews have talked about this. Sure, and but, I'm, but, that's not even where we go with this. But um, it was such a great band, just commercially too. That, you know, it was universal. Everybody could see themselves. Kids could see themselves in this in this group. I just did a, a record, it's called Women of Sunset, and it's about 65 years of female artistry at this studio, and we recreated it all. And, you know, I didn't want it just to be a bunch of old white ladies, you know, it's like, <laughs> let's <Yeah>. get <laughs> right. Sheila E and Janet Jackson, and, and um, you know, I want young female artists to see, it's about, you know, inspiring and having kids pick up instruments and learn about this, not just from a laptop perspective, but, you know, well, I, I work learning with, keys on yeah. at home. Prince calls you up and that was kind of him just to keep you in the, the groove of things and the music. And I mean, why would you ever want to quit? Did no, I had no reason to quit. Yeah. Uh, although I was... This is I, my job, Prince. Yeah, it was my <laughs> job. There was, there was really, I, I had no reason to quit. I felt very upset though, 
that I was losing my bandmates because I loved sure. them dearly. And I just was like, oh, don't do it, you know. So, but and that's that's life. He had met Sheila E. then, and there was also, I mean, creatively he was probably progressing and wanted some new inspirations around him, which yeah. seemed like he would kind of run through people yeah. quickly. And when he, he was done, he was, I mean, I, I work with an artist right now that's like, it's, it, was Prince a narcissist? Was he a narcissist? Yeah. <sighs> some people think so. I mean, you I know, think everybody is to some degree. We all have to have a certain amount of uh, narcissism. Um, but from my observations now, in hindsight, possibly he had some of that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's interesting learning more and more about this with people. Did that you keep fun. in contact with the revolution? And did they view you as not a traitor, but like you should have disbanded as well? No, no. They never felt no bad that way blood. at all. No, there was none of that. I, I was always friends with them. And uh, I did lose touch with Wendy and Lisa for a number of years, but I was always in touch with Bobby and Mark Brown. And Mark did not get f let go. He left on his own volition at that point. In fact, he had given Prince notice a year before the Purple Rain tour. Oh, wow. But nobody else knew this. Why? I don't know. Was it he, over Kiss? No, I, I'm not. That's a good question. I'm not sure. But... Uh, he just wanted to do his solo thing. He had offers for Motown at that time, and he just wanted to go on his own. But and he let him know that at the end of the Purple Rain era, that or by maybe it was later. He he must have told him after, like during the Parade album, that he was leaving. So for that before that last tour, which supported the Parade album, yeah, yeah. And I I wasn't even aware of that until much later that he had. Uh, I knew he quit, but I didn't know he had given his notice. So early in the game too you know I, I he was just in the hospital for an extended period of time i was talking to him because he's yes. going to come in here and i you know i want everyone to just tell their experience because it's solely just to keep the longevity of the studio running but to document things and i want everybody to know about prince i mean there's kids that come in this room that are 20 years old they don't even know the doors are and jim morrison yeah. did six records in this room right but marcus is he's he's uh He's going to be fine. He's okay. During that period, 1999, especially the Purple Rain era, what were the uh, synthesizers you were, you were bringing in? Well, uh, we had the OB-8s, I believe, at that time. We'd been using the OBXAs and the OBXs previous to that and then the SEM modules, as I mentioned in the beginning. And then we, I, I brought the DX7 in at that point oh, wow. to Prince, and then he started using that. And then we still had the ARP Omni in the arsenal, ARP Omni 2, which was used on the 1999 song itself. And then we, I had a memory Moog at that time on the Purple Rain Tour, which was used for the bass part to I Would Die For You, which was sequenced Sick. and locked to the Lynn drum machine, which was modified with a MIDI output, which they didn't have back then. We had our tech guy don bats put a midi output to the synth and the sequencer locked up to the lin and that's how we did that and um i i would die for you yeah and i would die for you killer and uh and then we had the yamaha cp70 uh, electric piano acoustic electrics up there too would you prince had one i had one he was an incredible piano player. I have tapes of him here sitting oh. there for five hours, not getting up one time, right. just going through everything. Yeah, Prince, you know, you go watch the the, the piano and microphone concerts. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, where was that? He did them all over. Oh, and then they glued them all together to yeah. have that record? Yeah. Gotcha. How did the, the stuff when you were writing together, like the group writing process, how did that go with the revolution? Well, it, it was rare. There wasn't a lot of that where okay. we were writing together. Um, but the process would either be uh, just sitting in the rehearsal space and jamming, you know, or, or he'd show you a skeleton of a song and, and then he'd want you to <clears throat> elaborate on your own parts. Yeah. Would everybody be able to contribute ideas or was it kind of like, hey, yes. I came up with this A minor riff and we're going to do this? But no. you came in that day, you'd be like, hey, what do you think about the doot, doot, yeah, doot? Exactly. Doot. Yeah, that, that could happen for sure. Yeah. Yeah. She's always in my hair. I love that song. It's a great song. I was not involved with it. I wish I had been, but no, it's one of the ones I didn't. Me work and on. photographer Matthew Batone 
mm-hmm. uh, were talking with Bill Jackson, who worked with Prince uh, for 30 days here at Sunset Engineer. But we figured out that that sex shooter, the line, and she's always in my hair, that synth line, do, 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 that's yep. also sex shooter. It's also the same kind of yeah, exactly. line that he, he would recruited. do that too. He would take songs and then reformulate them, retitle them, use them parts of other things. Sure. Um, bring them back even. Yeah, absolutely. New Power Generation. Yes. Tell me about the formation of that. Okay, so because of the revolution being disbanded, uh, he had decided to bring in a lot of the members of Sheila E's group at that point. So you had Levi Caesar and Miko Weaver. He kept uh, Eric Leeds and Matt Bliston on horns, who were actually you know, on the family stuff. And Eric was kind of touring with us a bit at that time too, on the parade tour for the around the world in the day and parade albums, you know, at post purple rain. And, uh, I'm trying to remember Bonnie Boyer was brought in on keys to replace Lisa Coleman. Miko was brought in from the family to replace Wendy and, uh, Sheila on drums at that point. And you're living in Minneapolis. Is yeah. Paisley up and running by that point? Paisley officially, officially uh, by the time we did, uh, yeah, the first tour we did, you see, the, the, the revolution was done by uh, end of 86, and then it was the summer of 87 <clears throat> that we toured Sign of the Times in Europe. Paisley Park uh, officially opened in, uh, I think, 87, early 87, like February or so. And then by the time we were finished with the Sign of the Times tour, we came back. We'd been filming live performances for the the concert movie at that point. And then we came back to Paisley Park. And this was the first project, I believe, one of the first in the big soundstage room at Paisley that where we did uh, extra shooting, where they had the full set of the tour set. You know, wow. the stage was set up in there. And then they were able to do special close-ups and some other things that they, they weren't doing uh, in the live shows. And then that's how that worked out. When did your tenure with Prince end? It was a uh, early '91. And this is, you know, I a lot of people forget hip hop's coming into play then, yeah. and that kind of destroyed funk dance. Kinda, you know. But the only reason I was uh, left at that point is I was working on some production projects for the first time in my career in Minneapolis. And he he wanted me to go somewhere on t- like do a special show somewhere uh, way out of like in South America, and I had just started producing this project and I'd signed the contract, and then I couldn't get away and I told him this is really difficult for me because if I if I let this go it's I, I'll lose the project and then um, he didn't really wasn't able to really come to terms with what I needed in order to walk away from that. So that's why he he moved on. Gotcha. Yeah, so one that, of those things. What was the last time you played on stage with Prince? It was probably in Japan in 1990 in September, the tour of Japan. Wow. We had done Europe, and then we went to Japan that year too. And that tour ended. Then yep. If you weren't there for him, you were pretty much done, though, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. That's what happens, I guess. And that's pretty common for a lot of these artists. Sure, I know, sure. Uh, you know, a lot of big names. It yeah. doesn't matter what you and have going on, bl- you need to be on standby. And I felt bad at the time. I didn't really want to be let go. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, it's one of those things. And I was, you know, was kind of ready to move on after 12 years, though. You know, so it I didn't bet. feel real bad, but, you know, it was a new thing. And so I just, at that point, I decided to just... Uh, get into production work and I, I had met my wife and we wanted to raise a family. So I thought, you know, I, I don't know if I want to be on the road a lot while I'm raising kids. I, I just want to be doing studio work and uh, yep. playing live locally when I can and that kind of thing. So that's kind of what I got into at that point. All good things come to an end. Yes, that's right. I do want to ask you about uh, Vanity, who was originally cast in Purple Rain. Yeah. You did some work on her record or recordings or something. No. I did not work on Vanity. You know, it's it's tough also for a lot of 
people to remember things. One, you worked with them so long and so extensively on so many projects that it almost becomes numb. It's kind of like rec yeah. remembering records that were done here. Yeah. The people that can kind of remember stuff are the ones that did like three days with him. Yeah. And they remember every detail on that. But for like you, Bobby Z, David Z, Susan, Peggy, everyone, it's like, this is just another day. We did three yeah, songs that exactly. day. Exactly. Maybe I did work on a vanity <laughs> yeah. song somewhere along the way. Probably did. Is that on my resume? Yeah. Yeah. But okay. It must have been. I, otherwise, I wouldn't have put it there. It might have been actually him doing it, though, and you, he, she wasn't even there. Yeah. Did I you ever meet her? Oh, oh, yeah. We were actually, you know, friends in a lot of ways. Wow. I mean, we communicated and stayed in touch even after she left Prince. She, she would talk to me at times. And she, she was actually... Um, Towards the end of her life, she called me out of the blue and said, I'm, I'm trying to do a documentary about my life and I want you to do the music. Oh my gosh, wow. And uh, I said, yeah, I, let's, I'm very interested in that. So she just was so ill though, she just wasn't able to follow through, unfortunately. I'm glad that she got her life together right at the end. Though. Yeah. And that's yeah. special. Yeah. And found God. Yeah. Do you know who wrote Manic Monday? Yeah, Prince did. Okay, thank you. Question <laughs> answered. What was your favorite song to play live with Prince? Live. <laughs> See, I get this. I get this question from interviewers all the time. In the it, in the in the it, Revolution era, though, like when you yeah, every night you're like, oh, here it comes. Baby, I'm a star. I like that one a lot. And when doves cry, I'd say the top two. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. What was a moment that you personally had with Prince that you'll never forget that was very special with you that only you would know about? What's something you did with Prince that was maybe oh, okay. you beat him in basketball one day out here or you... Well, we used to play ping pong. We used to kill each other over ping pong. <laughs> we played ping pong during breaks and basketball. And sometimes you take the band out to a, a baseball field and we'd uh, play softball. But that didn't happen really till uh, the Sign of the Times band. I remember. I don't think he did that with the Revolution, but yeah, he he liked to take breaks and do something recreational. Was every show pretty solid? I mean, yeah. I mean, he was rehearsing you guys into the ground and. Yes, he would rehearse us to where we could do it in our sleep, and basically I could, because we would really get tired on the road. We were taking B twelve shots sometimes backstage before shows because we were so run down. <laughs> that was one of his tricks, oxygen and B12 shots. <laughs> I just can't believe he never would like take a, a, a puff off a joint or something. Or no, no, nope. he was he was adamantly opposed to I know. alcohol or any drug use. Did you ever see a picture of him in here? We've been trying to find it and we'll pay like top dollar for a picture. No. Because we can't have never found one. No, and he by by the by the time Purple Rain rolled around, none of us were allowed to take a photo of him with our cameras. <sighs> wow, that was from management. And, yep, and yep. One question from sure. fan beautiful ones, well, Doctor Fink. Thank you so much. Can't wait for this. But do you remember anything from the beautiful ones? That song. Yeah, he wrote that and tracked it in here. Did the vocals here? But do you remember just that I early had demo to, or anything? Just or? that I had to learn it. Okay. When I handed it to me, <laughs> you didn't hear an early demo of it or anything. No, I, think I heard he wrote the, it. I heard the finished version for the movie soundtrack, and then we, Lisa and I, worked the parts out for that one. That's one of my favorite. The vocal performance at the end there is unbelievable, unbelievable, like nothing. It's a, it's otherworldly. Prince, yeah. you know, his music. He had something for every mood. You know, there was it wasn't like just one genre. It's like yeah. you go from the beautiful ones, the lady cab driver, to the cross, or it's just. Yeah. It's so, yeah. He's a, he's amazing, and because of that, I that helped me be a diverse producer as well. You know, <laughs> are you tired of talking about Prince? No, I love talking about Prince. Susan does too, but other people don't want anything to. No, to I, say. I love talking about Prince. This is how I look at Prince. Prince uh, was and is wherever he is. He's a genius. He's a, he was. A gift from God. He was channeling stuff probably from the universe, was flowing through him, and he was put here for a reason. And that's it. And yes, he was a human being and he was flawed like all of us. And he did things, yes, that could be bad, and he did great things. Yeah. And that's all I can say. 
And you as the consumer, the listener, the viewer can magnify what things you want to. Some people That's like right. to magnify only the bad things. And and I have forgiven him for any transgressions that he may have perpetrated on me in, in my time with him. There were, there were difficult moments. Sure. Yeah. Were you shocked when you heard that he had passed away? Absolutely. It was like losing a family member. I, I went into a state of complete, utter shock that day. Uh, it was it was like losing a parent. Who told you? Well, this is an interesting story because I was at my job down. And I, I worked for a company that was doing tech work and music business work uh, starting in January of 2016. And in April of 2016, I was at my office and I got a call from a friend who lived in Chanhassen where Paisley Park is, Chanhassen, Minnesota. And he said, I just heard, I have a friend at the, uh, one of my friends at the police station, I know the head of the police of Chanhassen said they found someone who had passed away at Paisley Park. He called me and I said, you got to be kidding. I hope it's not Prince. Oh my God. He says, they don't know who it is yet. Wow. And I, and I was like, oh God, I know there's only two people living there right now. I knew that he just had an assistant and maybe a couple other people that come and go during the day. And I just felt it. I could feel at that time that it wasn't, it didn't feel right. And then about a half hour later, he called me again and actually confirmed that it was Prince and nobody else knew yet. The media had no news of it. They, the police had not released it. I literally knew before everybody else knew because of this person. Oh my gosh. So I'm in my office and my couple of coworkers who were on my team said, hey, you want to go for lunch? And I go, I can't eat. I go, why? I just found out Prince passed away and they went, what? I mean, it was just like unbelievable, unbelievable. And then the, to make matters worse, at that time, I was performing with a band that was doing Prince music. We were called the Purple Experience based out of Minneapolis. And uh, we had a show to do the following night in Chicago and mm -hmm. they all wanted to cancel. I said, yeah, let's try and cancel. But the promoter and our booking agent said, you can't, this is under contract, the show is sold out. The promoter does not want you to cancel, you gotta do the show and the fans are gonna wanna hear Prince music because he just passed away. And that's what we did, we, we, we wow. went and performed. What yeah. was that like? It wasn't fun, it was weird. I was at the airport watching Prince news on CNN, sitting there and seeing my picture come up on videos and stuff while I'm getting ready to fly out of Minneapolis to go do this show. When was the last time you spoke to Prince? Uh, I spoke to him probably several times in 2015. Over what? Um, with, it, it was just, he, he had, in 2014 actually, he was kind of interested in reuniting with the revolution again. And he, he expressed that interest to me. And I said, great. I'm, I'm, he asked me if I'd be interested in doing that. And I said, absolutely. I'd love to reunite with everybody. And then he I never he never followed through. Yeah. I just do recall when at that meeting I didn't think he looked well. That's all I can say. Even a couple of years before he passed, I thought he he looked a little funny. Wow. That's all I know. So he seemed fine. That was in person? Yeah. And but so he that, seemed fine. And that was but then he was calling you in twenty fifteen as well? Yeah. Yeah. We were just talking business. There were some issues with some royalties and stuff that and I was he'd call to. you personally about that i called him gotcha yeah so you had a direct contact you yeah. could get in touch yeah. with him and yeah wow well i can't tell you how much it means and, for you know, you to... and when i put out a solo album back in 01 he promoted it for me on his website too and then my album came out literally the day before 9 11 <sighs> which didn't help things at all for that that oh, album wow. <laughs> but you know whatever but he liked it you know you need he was putting my record up there and Mark Brown had one and Sheila E was p putting all these uh, Prince alumni artists had albums out that year and he was helping to promote them for us, which I thought was really generous. If I brought a young artist in here, maybe they're 14 or something, what three songs would you have them listen to to turn them on to Prince? Oh, I, for sure, like I'd, I'd play the first single Soft and wet, it's brilliant, really cool song. For his, it's like, oh, listen to this. This is play, this is his first thing. His freshman offering, check it out. 
you know, yeah. listen to the whole record. Then from there, probably fast forward to like, Lady Cab Driver or something on 1999 or Controversy and then whatever, anything off Purple Rain, you know. Did you like this, the later stuff in the 90s? Yeah, I did. There, were, I found a lot of things I liked that he did after that. And then there was one album in particular, which I, I don't recall the t- which one it was, but when I heard some of the stuff, so, someone played it for me for, for the first time because I hadn't listened to that album long time this is a long time ago but when i listened to it i i couldn't recognize him in it at all from what i remember him doing he had reinvented his whole thing the rainbow children oh no i like the rainbow children record i i was actually at the premiere of that listening party at paisley park i loved that record and that to me sounded like him but there was one earlier where it didn't sound like him anymore of what i like the 80s prince at all it just it, his voice his tone of his voice didn't even sound like him yeah. it was a whole different person really interesting i found that to be interesting i enjoyed the music but it didn't sound like prince music to me it sounded like a whole nother person very strange later in 2014 do you think he was had people that were there for him absolutely he did have a lot of great friends absolutely you hear stories though that he would show up at like clubs by himself sometimes or do weird things and just always alone and he was living at paisley alone Mm -hmm. i didn't know if he was kind of isolated and depressed at that time and i'm not sure yeah, I'm not sure. I've been working with Kirk Johnson, the drummer, who, you know, with the the Funk All Stars, like I was saying before. But he, and and I've talked to him, and he he was always close to Prince up until the end. He was like Prince's right hand man, and was helping him, you know. And he he did his best to deal with the drug addiction. He didn't even really know a lot about it. He wasn't even totally aware that that was going on. Yeah, no one was. Yeah, until, until, you know, and then when he realized how bad it had gotten, that's when they tried to intervene at, at that time. And that was just like a month before yeah. he had passed. Right. And then the plane landed and um, sad. Yeah. But we can carry on listen to his music. I That Third Eye Girl band, project, yeah. yeah, with when they do She's Always In My Hair, yeah. the live version, that's the coolest it's thing great. ever. We recreated it in here, actually. No, they, that was a great band, too. Yeah, He always had great musicians around him. A- anybody that came and went with him, he always picked, you know, technically gifted players. And this is real music. These are by real, real musicians. musicians. <laughs> <laughs> we'll end on that note. Dr. Fink, what's your socials so people can check out what you're promoting, you're into, what music you're creating? Is well, it- I'm just on Facebook because, you, you know, because I got on there back in 06. I'm still like the old the OG on Facebook uh, under Matthew Fink. And then I got at Matt Fink one on Instagram. I'm on Dr. Fink 1980 on Twitter or X now. Uh, but I'm not extremely active on social media these days, only to promote a live shows I do from sure. time to time. But, yeah. you know, sometimes I'll post stuff like, you know, happy anniversary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, you know. That's how I learn about concerts yeah. and everything. Yes. Cool, yeah, so. I mean, I, I do it, use it for promotional purposes. I don't like to, to uh, debate politics on any platform. Okay. Well, let's go play some synths right now and enjoy the day. But I can't tell you how much this means to me to have you sit down and uh, you're just such an integral part of some very, very special, gigantic music and uh, especially here at Sunset Sound. Those records are so iconic. So thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right. (laughs) 